My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome once again to the How to Disaster podcast. My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson. I'm the CEO of After the Fire USA. Today's guest is a dear friend of mine, uh, Michael Mortar. So I met Michael Mortar about mm, three years ago and after he was appointed to be the wildfire recovery ombudsman for the state of Oregon. In 2020, Oregon experienced the worst wildfire season on record, and they had to really innovate. While there were some things they could look to other states like California to figure out what to do, in other ways, arguably, they really improved upon a system. One of the things that they did was really look around to see, like, how can we actually help our communities, especially very rural communities, navigate this really terrible, terrible time that we've had with megafires? And they chose Michael Mortar, which I thought was really smart. He'd had about 28, 30 years of experience in state government already, and particularly in the area of insurance. So this is very important service. You know, I also really liked the fact that he was very protective of his community. And he said to me about a year after I came in, he was like, you know, Jen, when after the fire came here, I just wasn't sure. Like, how would you get into Oregon? How would people listen to you? Would this work at all? But now he's buying the Kool-Aid, and I really appreciate that. I don't mind a community that is um, a little bit suspicious. That's okay. You know, these disasters are really terrible events, and a lot of people rush in who have very hmm, not good intentions, but I do. And I'm glad. I'm gl- so glad that he um, took the time to really vet me, took the time to vet the organization, and then he leaned all of the way in. And since then, he's been a tremendous thought partner for me. He actually left uh, the the state after about um, 18 months is how long they funded that position. Side note, in the world of how to disaster, we argue that three years is the right amount of uh, right amount of time for almost any position in a mega fire. Five years is better depending upon what happened and you know what the parameters are where you are, but really three years. Regardless, we applaud the state of Oregon for this really innovative, very cool thing they did, even creating a position like the wildfire recovery ombudsman. And, uh, and we're very happy that Michael is now you know, in retirement in a private consulting firm. And he's going to come on today to talk to us about his experience in that position. So please help me welcome uh, Michael Mortar to the How to Disaster podcast. Once again, welcome to the podcast, Michael. Thanks, Jen. Great to be here. You know, I um, I love your story, and I, I was talking in the intro about that the Oregon California thing, and how pleased I was when you sat me down a year later, and Pam was there too, and said basically like, oh, I was skeptical, but um, now I'm a believer in what you do. So you know, side note. I took that as a huge compliment coming from you. Uh, what I would like you to do is when we start this podcast, sort of set the scene for us. It's 2020, it's the summer. What are you doing in your job? And then tell us your fire story. Okay, well, thanks, Jen. Yeah, that's an interesting series of building blocks. So 2020, I was in transition from a, a, a challenging post. I'd paid my dues working at the... Uh, Oregon's Health Insurance Exchange, which was a debacle in its own right, out of the gate. And so we had to do a several-year course correction on rebuilding the exchange. Um, I went on a job rotation with the state to the Construction Contractors Board, and that all landed right as COVID was getting underway. So it's like, wow, where is my footing now? Um, Does it make sense to return? This was a nine-month job rotation. So I came back but really wanted to do something else for the last two years of my state career. And that was um, put in process. I, I was uh, given the opportunity to return to the insurance commissioner's office and that start, the Oregon insurance commissioner's office. And that started September 1st, 2020. So <laughs> I had like, okay, great. I'm the, the, the old sage guy who's going to help them on their legislative agenda, right? And this will be my glide path, and I can see what the next two years look like. 
Oh, wait, if, make sure people know how long you had already been working for the state by now. So you're really like at the tail, you're at the tail. Yes, end. yes, yes, no, thankful uh, for that clarification. So it was um, really 20 plus years at that point. So I'd worked for the insurance commissioner um, for four years. I'd worked for the state building codes division. I helped him launch a statewide outreach program. And I think of all the experience I had, that was the really pivotal one because we have a statewide code, but it's enforced locally. And so there's this tension between the state and local governments. And I just think in so many ways that blessed my ability to connect with local government because I wasn't coming in and that ombuds role is, we've got this figured out, you need to do what we tell you to do. Right. No, right? So. So that experience at building codes was really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, in this in the health insurance realm, I did a lot of statewide travel and so built connections with the business community and key stakeholders. So that just kind of built out the network to what purpose I didn't really know until the fire hit. So you had and, social capital, a lot of social, yeah. a lot of built social capital, very important in disaster a lot of yes. technical knowledge at the same time and some degree of compassion and understanding for the uh, distrust or tension between the space between state government and on the ground local government just just for those of you listening like how do you even do that i just want to make sure yeah that you're that they're catching that very yeah, big, it, very big skill set it's important and i think the ability to build trust quickly with local government stakeholders can't be understated. Yeah. In this case, there were a number of folks who were still around in the building programs that knew me. And thankfully I'd maintained those relationships, even though it'd been several years since I'd been in the field. And you could really feel like a sense of relief. Like stuff has hit the fan, but Michael's here and that's a good thing. And it just starts opening doors, I think, that otherwise don't open when, as you well know, right? People come in, we're here to help. It's like, well, really? Are you here to help? Because we got a problem. Yeah, because a lot of times, not really. Not necessarily. No. I mean, they, it's like they're bad people, but they're only there for like the first six to eight weeks and then they're gone. Like, So right. it's September 1st. You're in this new position. What happens? I report for duty and because it's COVID, everybody's working remotely at that point. So, right, I signed whatever paperwork I needed to sign that, at that point. Um, and then just really was plugging back into the insurance commissioner's work to say, all right, where can I add value? Um, I'll take the role. Uh, obviously, um, at that point, I would have been a, a senior policy advisor and was Suffice to say, the only gray beard in the group. So I was looking forward to being able to help guide the legislative agenda and some really good talent they had on board. Uh, the fires hit. And for those within... people who don't know, sorry, I know I'm in but I really yeah, yeah. want to make sure that because I don't yeah, want you yeah. to gloss over how profound I love this story <laughs> so much. And I wish that everyone would get a wildfire ombudsman. So if I'm interrupting a lot, it's because I really do like it. Um, what happened in Oregon and when? Just so people can get a flavor yes. for it. Yeah. Yes. So Labor Day weekend um, was when our fires hit. And ironically, we were actually up uh, one of the canyons. It was 24 hours before the, wire, before the fires hit. And we were looking at a piece of property with some friends thinking, this will be perfect. And we had the opportunity to camp. Thank goodness we didn't. Um, but um, yeah, it, it was in that category. Do you know what's coming? No. And then things changed so quickly. Like we had a really highly unusual low humidity event and you could just feel the air drying out like the prior 48 hours, I'd say. And then the winds kicked up um, that night. And once they did, um, it was just a matter of time. And so we had tremendous, um, as we've shared, right? Tremendous loss of structures in eight counties uh, in Oregon. Um, thankfully, loss of life, considering these fires came mm -hmm. down at night in heavily 
are in predominantly rural areas, at least in two of the counties. And um, I think we were really lucky to get away as we did. Um, yeah. And uh, just to set it so people understand, like Oregon had never had mega fires like this before. And even the, the fire chief in um, Ashland in that area we were in a meeting together and he was, he was like, okay, I had gone to California and had done mutual aid several times, but I didn't expect it to happen here. Even though at that time we were just a few miles over the California border. It wasn't yeah. that he was, he wasn't dumb or simple. It was just that this is magical thinking afflicts all of us. And um, it was a stunning amount of mega fire across a state in one fell swoop as many complex fi complex fires or many fires that came together to form complex right. fires huge variation and who was affected too so sorry go ahead no that's really important because um yeah it was over a matter of a day and we had eight counties um from close to the portland metro area all the way down to southern oregon and it ranged from um where your fire the fire chief you were referring to fairly urban area. That fire down in the Talent Phoenix area were neighborhoods, city neighborhoods that just were eviscerated. Um, the other areas around the state were definitely more rural. Um, and so we've got that mix, right? You, you have some, one county in particular uh, has, has really struggled with recovery because the burn scar is in an unincorporated area. And when you're trying to provide services without a local connector that, that can recognize that and do that work, mm -hmm. that's difficult. It is difficult. And the trust factor is, trust is always an issue in every disaster, but trust in a rural or frontier community is very hard earned. Like they are not going, you can't just like drive in there and think that they're going to trust you. Like that's not going to work that way um, because they are so used to us uh, being self-reliant. They rely on community, but they rely on each other. Outsiders, yep. you know, yep. not the fave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you are watching all of this unfold and what happens? I report to work the next week and somebody comes over to my desk. It was the day I was in the office and said, hey, they really need help at the emergency command center. Uh, can you go over for a couple of days? It's like, sure. I had been around state government a long time, but I have no idea what I'm walking into. And as you know, it's the Red Cross. It's the National Guard. Everybody's housed there. It was organized, but I'm thinking, where is my place in this, right? Because they just needed somebody to help um, on answer some of the insurance related issues and just be a, um, be a go between, at least that was the initial goal. And thankfully I was seated. I remember this very clearly walk in and they're like, hey, this briefing's starting and I'm just all eyes, right? Like, what can I do to help? And I was seated between um, a key rep from uh, the Red Cross, uh, who had significant disaster experience, uh, Denise, and uh, a fellow Nick from FEMA, who had both been through this drill. And they looked at me, did a quick assessment, and they're like, oh, okay, so you understand local government. You've been around insurance. You've been around building codes. You're going to be more helpful here than you think. And so um, went through that first couple of days, really just answering and trying to be helpful where I could. And I was finally able to connect with a lead staffer from Oregon's then Division of, of Emergency Management. Uh -huh. And he was really the point person for the state and did a basically a short interview and said, I'm trying to figure out where I can best use you uh, over the next couple of weeks. And by the time I got through that conversation, he said, I don't think you're going back. So <laughs> this is not a rotation. Um, and I was like, well, that's all well and good, but where that really shifted was in probably the next week or two, Governor Brown made what I think was just a terrific decision, and that was to appoint Matt Garrett as our wildfire recovery director, because Matt had worked for the state for years. He was a highly regarded, um, very politically adept, astute uh, individual, and he was able to come in and hit the ground running and had the respect of the other agency heads immediately. Of course, he's working under the governor's uh, umbrella, but 
really just brought so much substance to the position and the effort and calm, frankly. Um, Matt and I knew of one another, um, but hadn't worked directly together. And we had a phone call probably my second week at OEM. And he just said, what can you tell me? And it was an hour and a half of just brain dump. Yeah. Here's what's working. Here's what's not. Here's what I think could work better. And at the end of that, Matt just said, well, keep me in the loop and consider me your direct report. <laughs> so um, I was like, okay, um, mm -hmm. you work out the details. I'll happily uh, come and come along. And so Matt actually asked me to write my own job description, which I'd never had that opportunity and, you know, gave it some thought and really crafted it where at the end of the day, um, as you know, my responsibilities were around the built environment. So really identifying barriers that were impeding permitting, um, wetlands, building official uh, interface, working with contractors, whatever that might be. And did that for the next almost two years. And it was phenomenal work. I got my hand up for a question. Okay. Um, is, is, it, is there a way that we can actually drop a PDF of your job description in the, in, in the description? Because I would really very much like other states um, to consider why it is that this is of particular importance. Like a lot of counties have an ombudsman for their building department. An ombudsman for a, a disaster is, uh, it's a very hard job. Somebody's got to, you know, has yeah. to be a bit of a unicorn, which is, you are a bit of a unicorn right. in that sense. Um, but if you can find people to fit it, and you can also, you know, always ask people who've done it too, like you, you've done it. And so there's, but anyway, is that right. possible to do? I'm, I'm happy to share it. It's a little dog-eared. Um, it was scanned as we were in the midst of all the chaos. So yeah, even no, better. I, think, I think it's worth, um, I definitely think it's worth states considering because you saw the difference, right? And yep. so the other thing that was in place for a number of years prior to the wildfires was the governor's uh, regional solutions program. Yes. And that's right. And, and I can't say enough about that because those staff had already been working in the communities and you worked with a number of them as well. Um, that too is a definite unique Oregon creation mm -hmm. where they're really trying to help troubleshoot issues at the local level in each region. Um, we should probably uh, drop a, can a, another link on regional solutions because in our after action report yes. in, uh, in Oregon, we specifically called out how fortunate it was that they had regional solutions in place. Um, in the case of Santiam Canyon, that they had um, the SIT in place, um, the, that for, you know, that collaborative piece, and specifically yep. they did this wildfire ombudsman program and chose you. Regional solutions is really breaking up Oregon into uh, manage, I think there are four or five, how many pieces? Remind me. Uh, yeah, I would say five or six regions. Okay. Um, and then they assign a person who then keeps their eye. It is like a mini ombudsman, um, you know. Very model. much so. And so it's it's very, very smart. And the name is smart too. It's Regional Solutions. And they're there to help with the issues that are coming up specifically. It helps lawmakers. It helps local government. It helps bureaucrats. You know, it helps the people on the ground trying to work it out. To be clear, Oregon has 4 million people. California, we have 40 million people. I still wanted it here, even if we had to break the ombudsman piece into like, uh, you know, northern, central, southern California. I think that we would have benefited from that. Yep. Um, so there were really great things in place. Um, not knowing that this would happen necessarily, but also undergoing the um, disaster that was really a catastrophe, which was COVID, which is a mismanaged disaster. Um, I mean, nationally mismanaged. Um, so can you then, so then the ombudsman piece, did you come up with that or did somebody else like the name of it? Because I love it. <laughs> uh, I have to give credit to a uh, former boss of mine from Building Codes. Uh, he's a very strategic thinker. And he had heard that um, Garrett was getting appointed and said, I'm guessing something's heading your way. And he was spot on. 
And so he planted that seed. He, for, and by that point, he was representing the state home builders. And he knew the value that I would bring to the position of hearing people out, looking for solutions and moving, really trying to move as quickly as reasonably possible, which, as you know, within federal and state bureaucracy sometimes is lower than we need. Um, yeah, but often. but to bring that just pragmatic skill set to the table. So yeah, um, he he dropped ombudsman. I latched onto it and said, "We'll take a run at it." And I'd always coveted, <laughs> I'd always coveted the title. It's like, boy, if I could ever do that work, and then here it was. You know, I tried to get a job as uh, with Permit Sonoma as an ombudsman after our fires, and the director, um, he though he he loves me, I love him. Uh, he had an ombudsman. I'm like, you're going to need two. But I work for a county supervisor and hiring a staff away from a county supervisor is fraught with uh, issues. So um, anyway, that but I told this is why when I saw that they had an entire one for the entire state for all of the fires, I was I coveted your position. I couldn't even have done it. So, it, you know, in the same way. So you are, so you're in this position, but then you've got to hit the ground and start talking to people and finding out what their problems were. Let's start in Southern Oregon. Uh, the Almeida fire specifically, it's in Rogue Valley. For those of you who don't know, it is a, an arson fire, although we never really get to know. I never really see like who that person is. I'm not really sure about that. Um, started in Ashland at the Greenway. Ashland is a much wealthier community than the two neighboring communities. There's not a green belt in between, so they just flow into each other. Um, Talent and Phoenix, uh, they were actually destroyed in mo most of their downtowns as well during this mega fire. Um, and it took out a lot of workforce housing and a lot of, um, of um, uh, mobile home parks very painful, um, a lot of uh, mixed status worker homes, you know, a lot of undocumented people who had paid maybe 10 or $15,000 for their single wide 10 years earlier. And then they find themselves homeless, not insured. There was one mobile home right. park that 99 out of 100 of the units were not insured. Um, and if you, or for those who don't know, unless you have a child or somebody in the house is documented, you are not eligible for federal relief. If somebody in the house is, then you are to a certain extent. So anyway, side note, let us start there. Talk to me about walking into that community. Yeah, I relied heavily and continued to throughout the process. Um, Representative Pam Marsh that you've gotten to know um, absolute She's a superstar. Mm -hmm. the, she is a superstar. Um, I've been around electeds most of my working career in two states and have met few people as pragmatic, smart, and kind. So that's an unusual package. <laughs> and also I've not heard... Office. I've never heard anybody, not that, that nobody has anything bad to say about her, but I have to say that, um, you know, I, I, I've never heard anybody say anything but good things about her, her willingness yeah. to, I think it's also like her willingness to listen yes. and then and act. And she wasn't offended. Like we sent her all of the legislation from California, which a lot of people don't like California there, um, that had been enacted at the state level since uh, 2017, and she was very happy about it. And then she just, but it, it's not like it's not a like for like for like. It was like, okay, what does my state need? Here are tools. Yes. That have to done. Not every elected can or will do that. So side note. Yep. Yeah. Keep going. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think it was really maintaining a steady um, check-ins with Representative Mark. So that if there was something she was hearing in the community or she was comfortable referring people to me at that point, because that was one of the sources. And then it was just connecting me to the community groups who, who needed help um, and trying to get the word out about, you know, what I could or couldn't do. And one of the things that I did have to draw a line around was anything tied to social services that just, yeah. for my experience and background, that was just outside the portfolio, right? So the case management work was not something I, I touched, but again, built environment. Um, I had, during my building code days, had Southern Oregon as a, a, 
geographic assignment. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people in the business community that I had met years earlier were still in key roles, right? So then, then it's working with them, um, leaning in with the local home builders um, immediately, like, what are you hearing and what are you seeing? And that was really helpful because most of these builders, in fact, I don't think any of them, if they'd ever built on the heels of a loss, maybe someone had water damage in their house, mm -hmm. but they had never worked with homeowners, right? As you know, these homes are eviscerated. So you can't even use yeah. the foundation. Can't even use and, the foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so to to work with those builders and ha and just say, look, what are you hearing and seeing that I could make a difference in? Those were really crucial relationships out of the gate. And even though I'm glad that you that you pointed out that, you know, we don't we I like to say we do equity, but we're not a social service organization. We we coach we coach entire communities. Um, and it's good to know uh, what you you know, it's good to know what your skill set is and to be very honest about that, because sometimes in disaster, we see people really crumble because they're way outside of their skill set and they hyperventilate in their desire to do everything and then they also have yeah. a hard time saying you know i don't know how to do that thing like i've never done case management we don't do that but we know who's good at it and that's really though you know part of what you absolutely came to really understand all of these social organizations because we get a lot of pop-ups after disaster which are great yep. if they are properly supported and funded and if they are properly led so there's all of the there's some ifs in there but um, they should not be discouraged. Often they also combine forces, which we like to see. Um, but getting people back, get, you know, dealing with a built environment becomes an equity issue as well. It also becomes a, even almost like a mental health issue because it can get people back and it can really remove so many barriers because so much of disaster is about secondary trauma, you know, and Third, third dairy is not a word, but if it should be, um, but you know, like <laughs> levels of the more barriers there are, then the more people who are already in trauma, you know, it's tr in trauma, um, become discouraged, yeah. depressed, um, you know, engage in, um, you know, behaviors that are not healthy for them or their community. So it's very, so don't, if you're listening to this, like, you think, oh, and I'm buds and built environment builders, but do not underestimate the ancillary benefits of that for the entire community rebuild, because we don't often see enough emphasis on engaging builders. We were just in Marshall Fire last week in Boulder, and we did have a builders meeting, and it was so good to hear from them and with IBHS and Smart Home America. But also, I realize like this is an underutilized um, space, that that's something that I will eventually want to talk to you about is how important actually the facilitation of that is and keeping them engaged. It's yeah. huge. Also, because that's all the fraudsters come in and um, a lot of them are from out of state, out of area, offering to rebuild all these homes. But you really want to strengthen the builders at home as much as possible and, and empower them. That's my soapbox. Well, to that point, Jen, I, I guess it's important for anyone considering this role um, to look for those connectors. And I think that's where you and I share so much. Like, we love connecting. Like, how do you solve a problem? Find the right people and get them in the room, right? And what I did see on the case management side, once we started, um, DHS got their program up and underway and their program manager I just caught in passing, it was on one of these Zoom calls where it feels like you've got 50 people on a call. I'm like, wait a minute, his case managers are getting questions about insurance and they are not qualified, right? So, but let's do this. And so I got a hold of my uh, friends at the insurance division and said, hey, we need to have a sit down so you can give them a primer and talk to them about the resources you offer because we don't want people, again, just having to revisit this and turn and where do I go for help? I've already lost my house and now I'm having a tough time dealing with this adjuster. I need help. It's there, but we really just, we have to think really broadly about those resources and timing and when to get them in front of people um, when it's most helpful. 
And as a side note, there is an, uh, an excellent nonprofit called United Policyholders that does help people after disaster. They just didn't have, they've never had a big presence in Oregon. And so they've had a little, they've had a very light touch there. Um, other communities, they have a much bigger presence, but you should absolutely, uh, uphelp.org, is, look at them if you're listening to this. It's just in Oregon, they didn't, they just were not really present in that disaster, I think, except for some Zoom calls. So side note, go ahead. Yep. And I, I do think that was helpful. Um, the learning tool for both of us, and it was also when I was working with Representative Marsh and reviewing some of those um, proposed bills that came through, is you have to know that every state has different insurance contracts, right? And so that I think was a learning curve uh, for the folks from United Policyholders. But once that was queued up. I, I, I think they had good visibility here for what they could do um, and certainly would welcome to them to the fold again. The other one, um, and for folks who are listening in, I had thought, oh, this is somebody that's working. Is, is, this, a, uh, is this a front for the trial bar, right? But no, they're an independent organization really looking to help consumers navigate insurance so they don't need to worry people don't need to worry about well am i going to give up a third of my claim benefits if i'm working with up and you're not no. so i no. think what i would recommend to people is yeah you, you make sure you're working with your insurance agent um you got an insurance commissioner in your office every or in your state every state has one um be working closely with them and then to the extent you can track down UP for some guidance, that's also helpful. Yeah, and they have uh, they have uh, things online. They have that you can that you can always access. They have roadmap roadmap to recovery. They have webinars. So we do highly recommend their services. Um, but in the sense of like, tell us how you uh, worked with because with local builders like every disaster community, they're also often affected by the disaster. And so when you were, so talk to us about like, your first steps in trying to sort of coalesce that effort. Well, in this case, it was helpful because they had actually a fairly active builders association wow. in Southern Oregon. So they had a chapter. Um, I knew their executive director from my time at Building Codes. Um, I knew several of the builders, but not all of them. And the hard part is, right, for a number of them, um, they already had work in the pipeline. So you don't drop your existing clients. You need to finish that work. Um, the other part was there was a clear difference between the builders who were willing to take the time and spec a bid so that as the insurance company looked at it, they could compare like for like. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have a, a complete bid, that made it a lot tougher for the homeowner to negotiate with the company. And so I really had to give gold stars to those builders that were spending the time breaking down. Um, well, sure, the insurance company is using the software to generate your claim activity um, and, and what a presumed reimbursement should be, but you really can't take that at face value. And I guess I would offer that for anybody, right? It's, it's a negotiation. So if you're working with your builder and he said, no, this is what you had and what they're specking is not the same, ask for it and get it. And if you've not yet burned down, congratulations. I'm going to make my mic is in a weird place. I'm just going to let that happen. Um, if you've not yet burned down, you do want to check with your insurance company because I think for most people who haven't burned down in their brains, they think, oh, if it was like a house fire and here's how much it might cost in order to either repurchase my home or to uh, rebuild it in the event of a house fire. In the event of a house fire, you can often keep your foundation. In the event of a mega fire, you cannot. It's, it's very different heat thresholds. Um, but also, suddenly you are competing with, in our case, like here, just in Sonoma County, 6,000 other families um, to rebuild at pretty much the same pace that you would like to. Right. And that means that the cost goes up tremendously. The occurrence of fraud goes up tremendously. Um, People who then wanted to bypass the rules, like in California, you can only give $1,000 deposit to a contractor. That's all they can take. But in our case, we had some people who wanted to naturally trauma 
trauma induced, wanted to get ahead. So they handed them a hundred thousand, 150,000. And a lot of people never saw that money again. And so side note, um, you know, it's very hard to navigate when you are grieving for the life that you had and it, you're, the life that you had was worth, is worth grieving over. Um, but to try to take a deep breath and don't make decisions that you may not be ready to make because everyone's in a hurry after a disaster. You know, that is a great point, Jen, because one of the things I was completely unaware of, even though I had an insurance background coming into this, was what are the ramifications for people accepting that money and then paying off their mortgage loan? Oh. Because they're, they're lenders, right? The lenders are like, oh, no, pay this off. Yeah. This is good. And God forbid, if people had a 3 or 4% interest rate, right? and they lost that by accepting the settlement, move forward two years by the time you can get a hold of a builder and now it's seven. Oh, we just talked about this last week when we were in Boulder. We had a meeting with both builders, but for the night before we had a meeting with Fannie Mae and, um, and fire uh, rebuilders, right? And so their fire is 20 months post-disaster right now. The stories were a appalling. I mean, the things that these people have been through, um, you know, being told by their lenders that they had to pay off their mortgage. And this means like not only, and then they have to get a construction zone. I mean, yeah. more, you know, and they have now they're subject to much, much higher interest rates, but not only that it's industry standard. It's definitely true for Fannie Mae. If you check, uh, know your options, um, Dot com, you'll see that this is true, that um, you often can just add that year onto the end of your mortgage. So if you have a 30-year fixed, you can make, become a 31-year fixed. There are no penalties, um, you know, that, but do, do educate yourself though, as far as if, is your lender going to, you know, report that to a, a, a credit bureau or, or are they on board? Are they telling you what's actually true? Um, we like bringing Fannie Mae into communities because they actually can hear what they are experiencing like a mobile home park in talent where there's only 10 units left, uninhabitable, for weeks, but the landlord based in Canada never stopped charging rent because he was a charming person who I'm sure is going somewhere hot. Anyway, so, <laughs> but like when people don't behave well, uh, you know, knowing what's going on behind. So use your lawmakers, you know, do reach out to um, Fannie Mae's, uh, you know, help. Uh, what's, they just renamed it. They're going to get mad at me if they listen to this. They just renamed the program. But there are other um, ways to navigate it. But pay, don't pay off your mortgage uh, unless you're sure that you have to. And it's likely you do not. And it's even more yeah. likely that you can wait another year. The other Another thing that we heard this time that I had not heard before is the number of lenders who, because they are they they accept the payments from the insurance companies, who were not only holding the amount of their current mortgage but anything above that as well. So if they had a two hundred thousand, oh. like some people got SBA mm -hmm. loans, or because you can get those now, it's a new program. You can get more money from SBA at a very low interest rate to actually build back more resiliently. SBA is another conversation. If you are denied, keep appealing. Um, but the lenders were actually holding onto even two hundred thousand dollars more. Just and they were they were accruing their own interest, but not paying the interest for holding all of the money to the actual fire survivors when it's their money. Not good. Annoying. Not kind or humane. Oh uh, well. Yeah, there you have it, right? So that for me was one of the one of the missing links that I wish we had really been out in front of um, because it can't be said enough. You don't have to do this in many, many of the cases and just take the time, get your feet on the ground, figure out what's happening. Um, but I think for some folks, it, they thought it would bring closure. Um, and it really doesn't because it doesn't move you further ahead in the process um, at that point. It doesn't. So I told, I interrupted you to go on a soapbox rant. So, okay. So you're getting the builders together. I think our point is well taken. Don't leave out the builders from yes. also the 
um, the good fuzzy side of this relationship, it is their community and they, they do want opportunities to help. I think in Sonoma County, at K uh, Keith Woods at, Sonoma, at North Coast Builders Exchange did a particularly good job of hosting builders every single week, whether or not they were members too. They were still yes. welcome to come in and talk about the rebuild. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let take us up to Santium Canyon. So Santium, what we saw in that rural community that's been so challenging, and I know in, in, this will resonate for rural areas on septic, those standards have changed, right? And rightfully so, we want to take care of our groundwater. But what does that mean if you had an 800 square foot cabin and a tiny lot, and now that's not as functional, or you've got to buy your neighbor's lot? And I, from my perspective, it's not progress if what you have is someone new to the community and now it's a house that is one in the place of three lots. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's a tough one. Someone early on told me, if you want to see gentrification, pay attention to the footprint of a disaster. And, oh, you know, yeah. tend to think of gentrification in a very urban context, but it's not. Um, and for both canyons, I think the McKinsey as well as the Sanium, um, getting those resources to the right folks is absolutely a struggle because the people who were appropriately insured and had capital rebuilt uh, fairly quickly. But if you were underinsured, and there's not as much capital, that's where we still have gap, very much gaps in, in, in both communities. And More so, insurance. You know, we yes. see the most no insurance in uh, rural communities, frontier communities. That's where we see you don't have a mortgage, then you don't have, then it's very common to not have insurance. And you understand why these people are not, you know, they're not irresponsible at all. That's not the point at all. They are often low income and what they just, they just, they can't afford the insurance as well until they can't afford not to have yep. it. Yep. Makes me so yep. sad. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I don't know if we've ever talked about solving for, I maybe, I'm, I imagine we have, but um, now that you are a private citizen, you can say things that maybe you couldn't when you work for the state. So my question is, is like, uh, one of the things that we're passionate about, because it came up in Santa Cruz as well, is that I do so wish that they would choose that that we could solve for toilets and sanitation for these rebuilding communities, especially to avoid gentrification and, and pushing out people who are part of that community. Um, the issue of septic, especially in a canyon near a river, it's not even the best thing for the environment. There's no way they can do sewer, but there are other technologies that are even 30, 40 years old that are just simply disallowed. How was that handled in Oregon? There's a process for alternative pathways through our Department of Environmental Quality, but that takes time to go through that process, unfortunately. And um, so there are some discussions, uh, for example, in the McKinsey, they were considering um, in the community of Blue River, um, their septic alternatives. And one of them was, was boring down, which was interesting to me. It's like, so you've got like a vertical septic? How does that work? Um, and at the end of the day, I think the price point was just out of reach of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that you have to keep in mind, all right, so septic is typically done at the individual level. There are options for um, more community-based systems, um, but anytime you're involving neighbors and it's expanded, if you don't have an incorporated area and a mechanism for funding it, that, that gets really difficult, right? So... Mm -hmm. Is it viable? And that's one of the questions for a community like Blue River. One, is it viable and at what cost? And do people want that? Would they yeah. would they say, yes, I'm I'm in? And so it it very much, I think the infrastructure issues in those river communities is is a huge one. And it's we've not successfully cracked it. 
We haven't. And, you know, you would be so uh, useful for any, especially I mean, in a lot of ways, you'd be useful for a lot of things. But in addition to the builders exchanges, but really helping communities actually navigate. If you if you look around your community right now and say you haven't yet burned down, but you've found this podcast because you've come to the end of the Internet, um, then I see one of the one of the points of resilience is really if your community burned down like paradise, the entire everyone's on septic, including the business downtown. How would you actually come back from that when septic can add 30 or $40,000 onto the cost of your rebuild? And because of the different, you know, it's the, the requirements are different from often when the homes were built. Um, I do in, in California, we have, I think it's called the K code of the California state building code, with, which Mendocino had to use in order to build back and to allow alternative methods of composting toilets, um, those sorts of ideas, but maybe as on the state level to really look at, like if we do have a disaster in one of these heavily rural communities, a huge point of equity, it's an equity issue, is yeah. um, how can we anticipate that we know that's going to be a problem and that they're not going to be able to afford that. But if we had an alternative, we'd already gone through and we knew that like, or three alternatives, whatever it is, because you can do those often for a few thousand dollars, which is very different from 30 to $40,000. So that's, you know, I feel like they should call Michael Mortar. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Bring it on. Right? Bring it on. So you go through, you have, um, so you spend um, almost two years in that position um, tell me about like, you know, tell me about what that was like and what you learned and what you found moving and what you found frustrating. Mm. I was so impressed by the capacity of people I got to know. And um, it really, I, I think I've always been more than a glass half full person, but I met so many talented people who did things completely out of the box. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example, um, when I had landed at, uh, this is probably like week three at emergency management. And I was like, okay, I think I have this figured out. Here's where I can help. And I was introduced to a fellow by the name of Mac Lind. Um, Mac is a, a younger but career guy at our Department of Transportation. And he was tasked with his leadership of the debris cleanup and figuring out how to do this, right? How to work with DEQ um, and his counterpart, Brian. I'm sorry, Brian, I'm drawing a blank on your last name. Brian was great too. The two of them just shouldered this enormous responsibility of, all right, the state has a multi hundred million dollar cleanup. I think the final bill was $300 million. Not in their just job debris. descriptions. Everybody, just just so you know, yeah. ours was a, a, a little, uh, it was a billion, I think for just Sonoma County. Go ahead. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So how do you do that? And um, they, much like several of us were like, hey, let's call California. So I will also do a shout out to the insurance commissioner's office down there. They were always willing to talk to me and talk to our staff. Um, your transportation folks that had done cleanup said, here's a best practice, but for the love of God, don't do this. <laughs> and so our guys are like, okay, we're not allowing that. Um, and I think seeing that work and the two organizations that had never done anything like this ran what I think was a highly successful effort. I mean, they wrapped up in a little over a year or maybe it was under a year after the fires. So at the end of the day, their stuff was, was moving along and the rest of the slog, as you well know, right now we've got to get houses on, we've got to get communities back. And that's, that's the long part. But if you have people that jump in and organizations just say, we're going to make this happen, as quickly as we can, God, that's amazing to see, you know? And so I saw that at the state level or mm -hmm. at the local level where people just really leaned in. Um, yeah. That's that's the and, good stuff. 
And in rural communities, a couple of note, like some of you might be listening to this and be like, oh, well, we had a wildfire in our area and we were cleaned up in eight months. Why were they over a year? We're talking heavily rural areas, complicated debris removals, often up very almost inaccessible roads. Like this was not simple. Um, and there were major environmental concerns, watershed issues, like uh, Michael mentioned earlier. And so every cleanup is slightly different. We did not know how to do it because we didn't expect it. So we had some over scraping issues and some, you know, oh, unclear yeah. communication. We thought um, our local environmental quality people thought, oh, they should come all the way down to the dirt until there's nothing in the dirt. And that was actually not necessary. Um, so there were, so mistakes were made, but we did put all, I, I feel like I hope that we put all of our mistakes to good use, but we certainly made them, you know. Yeah, no, I think that's important. And for, for communities to be able to reach out and say, hey, can you help us, right? Absolutely pay it forward. And so I, you're, I had forgotten that we had heard about the over scraping down there. And um, so it was really trying to find that balance of what, you know, what needs to happen. And then when you talk about the partnerships in the rural areas, the state had to move quickly and they were working on behalf of FEMA, right? So you've got this federal agency that generally is not, I mean, I don't know that anything federal is beloved in rural America, having grown up there myself, right? Yeah. Like we don't want the feds to tell us what to do, but getting that release so that people could go on the property and begin the cleanup, that took a lot of work for folks to be comfortable with, how is this going to happen? And so I think for communities to talk about that in advance would be well served. If we ever find ourselves in this boat, you know, there, there were a number of areas where there was tremendous pushback, like it was going to be a takeover, right? It's like, no, 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 it's a cleanup right? We're removing all these toxic things off your property at no charge. But it was a lot of work to get out um, in those areas and get that permission. And then I think when it was all said and done, people are like, oh, that worked really well. Yeah. And you know what? Nothing's going to be perfect for sure. And there's also uh, tends to be a lack of understanding. I remember, so for, for context, um, Michael and, and then Jim White from the Oregon Nonprofits Association, they came to us after they decided we were cool, which is fun. And they, and you guys said, you know, I love that you're down here in Southern Oregon, but we'd really like to see you in Central Oregon. Can you meet with this emergent leader, Dina Freres, and talk to her? Because she wears many hats. This is so common in rural and frontier areas areas that people who have any capacity whatsoever end up taking on like multiple roles and how to do the disaster but they actually had some really cool best practices up there that we stumbled ac across like their hospital district was sort of reformed yeah. to take the lead and it was genius and I, I just I, it was just so uh, wonderful and our job really just ended up being to meet you there and Jim, and to um, go around and, and listen to what everybody else was doing. And I was so moved to actually be able to say back to them, because they, they were worried, Dina was worried that we were going to see behind the veil. We'd be like, well, you're, you're, you don't know, you don't know what you're doing. And instead we were like, I don't know if you know this, but you're doing a great job. And none of us know what we're doing at first, but my goodness. And by that time they were a year at 14 months post-disaster. Um, look what a great job you're doing, but you as the ombudsman, you knew that we could still bring value to them, that it would look different, but you understood the subtleties of all of the communities, bringing it back to, to that, your role in that yeah. was just huge, you know? Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I was just on a call last week, um, sponsored by rural development initiatives. And, uh, it was a panel conversation, representative Marsh, um, Kevin Dial, who's the yep, LTRG yep. head yep, up the Santa and myself. And I think one of the things I definitely, if I go through a list of like top fives, they're at the very top for that model, but they would also tell you it won't work for every area, right? You can't ask your rural hospital necessarily in central Washington or Northern Idaho to do that work. But what is your model? Right. You have to have some structure so that when that event happens, there's a trusted grassroots network in place, because if you do that, 
like the Sanium, it just, I, I know they probably still don't give themselves enough credit for this, but you and I have both seen them, we've seen the work in the community and it was just phenomenal. Yeah. And I, I can't imagine where they would be without that effort. So and yeah, that's it. Existing social capital, like it doesn't have to be like, I don't need to form an organization that goes in and does all their stuff for them. Like that is not going to work there. It's not going to yeah. work in a lot of communities, although sometimes it works if they're more urban um, or suburban, but that the, the currency of trust and relationships, because also so many people who've been affected by a disaster they may not like it, there's a mental health component to it and they may not reach yeah. out, but if you know that they're there and nobody has heard from them, but you also know that maybe they need a new refrigerator or just that the, the, it's almost a bespoke model, but it's perfect for other people if you can adapt it to your needs, but yes. you have, now you have this repository of um, Oregon um, knowledge that's so that's so wonderful for Oregon, but can be expanded into other areas as an advisory role. So I'm advertising yeah. for you. I don't well, thank you. Idea, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, the other the other one that was significant from my perspective, um, and when we talk about that interface into the rural areas, um, Lane County knew they they already had a difficult relationship at the local level, right? Because as I mentioned, there's not an incorporated area there. So it, um, in leaning into that and what can we do better? One of the things they did is they created a position for, uh, it was permit navigator. And it wasn't somebody, one, they hired absolutely the best person they could have because she's approachable, she's honest, her follow-up's great. Um, but she was upriver two days a week right? That's, that's an hour long drop. Well, you've saved all those community members that much time. So why not take it on your shoulders as government to do a best practice? And like, we're coming to you. Yes. That was huge. That was huge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's trauma informed. It's huge. It's more efficient because you're going to reach more people. And, you know, for some people are like, uh, you know, um, they're not as concerned with the um, getting everybody back to the community as maybe some of us are. Um, but, you know, for economic stability, you need social stability. And that's the reality of yeah. it. You can actually feed, feed off of each other, which means that all the other systems have to somehow grind, you know, work together in a collaborative fashion to do it. So yeah. smart. Yeah. I like a lot of, I always tell people when they're like, oh, I want to come to California. This, I'm like, you know, it's much easier, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love my state, but it's so huge and complicated. And um, the space between your average citizen and then the state government, it just tends to be much higher yes. if you don't have access. And um access is um, incredibly important in your ability to recover from a disaster. So, and that's what you were giving them too, was access. So tell me what, okay. So I don't want to leave this conversation until you tell us like, so you get all this information and you'd be out in the field traveling quite a lot, I imagine. And then, and during COVID side note, yep. Yep. Um, and then you would filter it back upstairs. So what was the structure of that like? Yeah, that was the crazy part. So here I'm working for Matt, um, well-respected leader, who's just the guy. Matt, in turn, gave me so much latitude, just like, if you think it's the right thing to do, I got your back. Mm -hmm. So I really tried to identify if it was a quick turnaround and I can deal with a local conversation, let's do it. If I need to talk to uh, a department manager about, you know, hey, I, I think we're running into some hiccups, I do that. If it were to the point that we needed to go to top leadership, that's when I went to Matt. And mm -hmm. yeah, every time he went to bat for me, I was like, hey, I'm knocking heads. I can't get an answer and I need an answer. And I was like, poof. Oh, thanks, Matt. Um, so even though I had the history and the working relationships to have somebody who was the final say and really the head of the effort to be able to move the needle when I needed it moved was incredibly important. And so with Matt, 
Um, generally, I'd say most days I didn't necessarily have contact. I was just like, okay, this is coming in. I've got to deal with this. Does it rise to Matt's level? Think about it. Bring him in if I needed to. Um, I did a weekly summary every week, which yep. the other day I went back and started leafing through some. I'm like, oh my God, really? We did that? Um, so he got a summary and then we had a call. I got the summary to him every Friday. And then Monday morning, we started off the week with a half hour phone call to be like, okay, where we are, what do we have? What's coming down the pike? And otherwise he turned me loose. So I think that there's some important lessons in there in the how to disaster piece is that he didn't try to micromanage you, which allows you to learn and learning, you know, you can know everything about everything else, but learning a disaster is, you know, it's a whole thing. Um, and that you had like that kind of, that is pretty regular communication, a summary on Friday, a call on Monday. It's just, I like the how-to pieces too, because people could be like, oh yeah, we have, we have an ombudsman. No, we, we got that idea, check. Like, how do you actually um, execute it? And it's execution is, um, it's an art form. On, you know, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And so um, hopefully everyone in every state has a unicorn. So can you talk to us about what you are doing now? And, you know, what were you, what, you know, what do you, what did you like most about it? What are you carrying into the next phase of your life? Mm, good question. It was, it was hard to walk away from the role. And so your listeners are, are fully up to speed. It wasn't voluntary on my part. I wasn't fired. It just simply was the reality of what was a two-year job rotation or close to it. Matt was asked to come out of retirement to take on the job um, for X amount of time, and he did that. And I was pretty much attached to him at that point. So um, I did go back to work for the insurance commissioner, but realized my heart was in wildfire and I missed the work. So. Um, put in my retirement from the state of Oregon and thought about one, I took some time off, um, but then I formed an LLC mm -hmm. and I've had a couple of clients to date. Um, one of them was Oregon, um, goodness, it's not Oregon Solutions. Yes, it's Oregon Solutions. Thank you. I had to mull that over. It's like, wait a minute, it's not the regional solutions, Oregon right. Solutions which is based out of Portland State, mm -hmm. and they had been approached to help do work specifically up the McKinsey River. Mm -hmm. And so I was brought on board just to help on some housing specific and relational issues uh, for a period of time. That was great. I love working with the McKinsey. Um, and then since then, I've done some work for Lane County. So mm -hmm. back in the McKinsey, there's a, there's a theme here. Um, but now I'm waiting. The state is close to signing a contract that will, um, uh, with an outside provider that will hopefully mean continued work for me on a statewide basis and just doing what I do best. And also allowing you like that time because well earned, you know, retirement after decades in service to the state of Oregon, you can still serve the people in the state, but you can also have a little more time for. Um, breaks because you know disaster is super hard work you know yeah. and and you deserve to break and I know that um I I know I consider you a very valuable resource it's we've had conversations about this I'm like you don't even know like how how um, valuable your skill set is um for other communities even other states going through this that um to to have your background, but then have to having to learn wildfires so viscerally in an under a two year period. I actually, we did, I did write a letter to the governor's office at the time. And I said, <laughs> you really should automatically um, do this for a minimum of three years. Three years is sort of a magical number. People need it for longer, but three years, uh, a full-time ombudsman is actually the best number. They did not listen. That's fine. I'm just me. I'm not magical. Um, but if you are listening to this and you are at a state agency and you think, oh, you know, should I try this? I cannot high, more highly recommend that when you fund things, consider them in a, in a three, at least for the first three years post-disaster yeah. um, for wildfires. Right. You just, it's, it's gotta be. Um, so I'm very, um, I was, I was very, um, happy that, you know, I always love the people that I come into contact with in this work and unless I don't, but that's pretty rare. 
I can name them, but I won't um, because there's not that many that I think, oh, not for me. Um, for the most part, um, totally for me. And I'm very happy to have you as a colleague and a friend. Oh, likewise, Jen. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I hope that so we're going to drop some links and some documents um, into the um, into the uh, description. We also do a full transcript so you can, you know, find do a find all skip where you want to go. Um, we'll show you how to get in touch with Michael if you are interested in talking to him more. He has a, if just a lot of knowledge. You may think, oh, you know, two years and something, but it's not just two years. It's like, imagine you went to war for two years, how much you would know about that particular war. And that's the deal um, is that's how this work is. And um, and Michael <laughs> is certainly um, a veteran of that. So anyway, um, is there something that I didn't ask you that you wish that I had asked you? I think we pretty much covered it, Jen. Okay. All right, then. So this has been another episode of the How to Disaster podcast. Our guest today is Michael Mortar, uh, former ombudsman, a wildfire recovery ombudsman for the state of Oregon, and now in private practice. And um, thank you again for spending this time with us. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.